In his book, The Intelligent Investor, first published in 1949, the famous investor Benjamin Graham wrote this. The investor's chief problem, and even his own worst enemy, is likely to be himself. In this video, we're going to be looking at some of the behavioural biases that hold investors back. And we're going to start with one of the most prevalent biases of all, optimism bias, and specifically overconfidence. Optimism and overconfidence are not exactly the same phenomenon, but they are closely related. So it has been found that people are vulnerable to three types of optimistic biases. One has to do with the illusion of control. So people tend to think that they have some control over events that are independent of them. Yes, we know that historically equities have produced returns of around 5% above inflation over the long term. But the fact is, we don't actually have any control over the financial markets whatsoever. What you don't know is what individual stocks are going to go up tomorrow or which funds are going to outperform over the next week or month or year. Those are really driven by news. The second problem with optimism is what behavioural experts call superiority bias. The superiority bias, um, which is also called the better than average effect, is the idea that we tend to think of ourselves as better than average in a number of domains. So we may think that we are more attractive, smarter, more generous as well. There's just a, a feeling that we as humans have of exceptionalism, that we, that we all kind of think that uh, we're a little bit above average in whatever we do. So the idea that hope springs eternal among people in whatever it is that we're doing, I think um, you know, also applies to investing. The last of the three factors that Lisa Bortolotti referred to is unrealistic optimism or underestimating the likelihood of a negative outcome. Because what we might think is that um, our past performance or our knowledge of a certain field make us more able to predict what kind of event will happen. And I think in the financial world it's possible that we may think that we will be able to know whether a certain company will be successful or whether uh, certain rates will go up or down and, and this capacity that we think we have to predict how things will go will make us make decisions that are more bold. You have an investor, whether it's a private investor or a professional, and they make some good investing decisions. Now, as a result of that, that could lead them to believe that they've got a high level of skill. The fact is, they may have a high level of skill or they may have been lucky. Trying to beat the stock market is itself an example of optimism bias. That's because it's extremely hard to do. You need to do either or both of the following two things. One, pick the stocks that are going to outperform in the future. And two, get in and out of the market at the right time. The evidence shows that very few investors do either of those things consistently, and that includes the professionals. Part of the challenge investors face is separating the facts about equity investing from the myths perpetuated in the media. I think one of the more common myths is that good companies are actually good investments. And I think if investors were to uh, think about what goes on in a trade, they might realize that may, that may not be the case. So for example, let's say there's this wonderful company that the whole world admires. I don't know, let's call it Apple today. And I want to buy those shares from somebody who's already holding those Apple shares. Well, that individual is going to say, well, wait a minute, I don't want to give up these great expected returns in the future unless you pay me for some of those today. And that's why in effect, there are no basically free lunches lying around, is the seller demands a fair price given the greatness or the goodness of the company. Another problem is what's called skewness. In other words, it tends to be a small number of stocks that drive the bulk of market returns. Now you might think instinctively that your chances of picking a winner are 50-50, like a coin flip. 
In fact, they're lower than that. And remember, trading costs money. Every time you buy a stock, you need it to outperform just to cover your costs. So that's stock picking. What about market timing? In short, the reason that market timers do so badly is that nobody can see the future. I mean, this should be obvious to investors <laughs> that the future is an unknown. We, we, we don't know uh, what's going to happen a month from now, a day from now even. And this random, unpredictable news is what drives prices. In a paper on the likely gains from market timing, the Nobel Prize winning economist William Sharp calculated that market timers need to be right 74% of the time to make it worth their while. But studies show that the vast majority of stock market forecasters, with all the insight and resources at their disposal, come nowhere near that. That's why market timing usually leaves you with lower returns, not higher. And yet we're all tempted to give it a go. Well, arguably humans do this in all sorts of ways. You know, we, we ascribe information to things that we want to believe for a start. So things that resonate with us, we, we start to believe more and more in. Um, you know, people will, will, will pick up and listen to all manner of things, including you know, horoscopes at the, at the extreme. So one way you can minimise the negative impact of optimism bias, both your own and other people's, is not to pay too much attention to day-to-day -day financial news. You should also ignore stock market forecasts altogether. And you can try to de-bias by focusing on the empirical evidence on how hard it is to beat the market. But there's one more important thing you can do. The real secret to getting bias out is not to make subjective decisions. You basically want to make decisions that are more or less automatic. So instead of trying to time the market, you would say, like, if you were investing, and say, I'm, I'm going to invest uh, every three months on a specific date. I'm, I'm going to invest whatever I have at that moment I'm investing. You will do better than if you try to save up your funds and, 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 and figure out where the market is going and then try to time the market. Optimism bias has to have an opportunity to kick in, right? And that's only when we make subjective decisions. Uh, that's when it kicks in. So the more you can eliminate those and, and go on autopilot, so to speak, the better off you will be in making investment decisions. So investors need to guard against optimism bias and overconfidence. But some investors have the opposite problem. Now, it might seem an obvious thing to say, but human beings don't like losing money. We really don't. Behavioural scientists refer to this tendency as loss aversion. Loss aversion is the fact that given a loss and a gain of equal value, the loss hurts more to us than the gain feels good. Some people are the other way around. Those are risk seekers. But most of us are loss averse, which generally means we don't want to put our money at risk. And that really hurts us when it comes to investment because in order to outpace inflation, which is the whole point of investing in the first place, we have to take on some risk. Otherwise, we won't get the return that we need in order to outpace inflation. Investing is inherently risky, and you shouldn't take more risk than you need to, than you're able to, or you're comfortable with. But most people are programmed to take less risk than is actually sensible. A simple example is that when a group of people were given a, a, a bet of the chance of winning £2,500, against the potential loss of a thousand pounds, they needed a better than 50-50 chance to take that bet on. Now logically that doesn't quite make sense. You've got a 50-50 chance on the toy costs and you've got the potential of a much larger upside than the downside. So it should be a fairly simple decision. Ironically, one of the biggest risks investors take is not taking enough risk. They spend too long with too much of their wealth sitting in cash. If you think about a moderate risk investor who would be otherwise invested in a nicely diversified multi-asset class, equities, bonds, cash, bit of everything in there, not too risky, moderate risk portfolio over the long term, you should expect to get over very long periods of time uh, returns in excess of cash of about four and a half to five percent from that portfolio. 
So if you are sitting with portions of your wealth doing nothing for long periods of time, you are effectively buying yourself the ability to get to sleep at night at the cost of 4.5% per year. Now that is an extremely expensive way of buying emotional comfort for yourself. Another example of risk aversion is the way investors take fright when markets start falling. That's when our survival instinct kicks in and we naturally want to protect our money. We've got a portfolio, it falls by 10% or 20%, whatever the number is, and we think it's going to fall more, it's going to keep on falling. So the instinct is to sell up, hold it in cash, and then don't worry, I'll get back into the market when things are better. It's the wrong thing to do. Timing markets is incredibly difficult. And therefore, selling when the markets have started falling is a dangerous strategy because the chances are, by the time you've got that optimistic feeling back, markets have recovered and you'll be buying in at a higher price to where you sold out. So how do you combat loss aversion? Well, first things first, you need to accept that for all equity investors, market volatility comes with the territory. What you have to acknowledge as an investor is when you invest in stocks, there's going to be volatility. There's going to be tough times. There's going to be good times. Set an asset allocation that you can live with that has a good balance between stocks and bonds so that you can ride out those tough times, stay disciplined during those good times, and then stop worrying because markets are good at pricing information. They're good at setting themselves up to have positive expected returns, but things that are unexpected always happen, and that causes markets to go up and go down. And here's another tip for those prone to loss aversion. Don't check your portfolio too often. Just once a year is perfectly sufficient. Almost all of us are myopic. We look at things in too short a time horizon and we are granular. We, we look at the detail before we look at the big picture. Uh, always flip that around. Whatever you're doing, try to look at the big picture first and then go to the details if you have to. And always try to look at the long term first and then look at smaller time slices if you have to. So accept volatility is perfectly normal. Don't keep checking your portfolio and focus on the big picture. Now, human beings are very social animals. We pay close attention to what others are doing and often like to mimic their actions. This is what behavioural scientists call herd behaviour or herd mentality. I'm at a dinner party you know, and I can never remember whether I take the bread roll on the left or the right. And I really can't. I genuinely can never remember. So what I do is I wait till somebody else does it and I copy them. And essentially that's what herding is, in, particularly in conditions of uncertainty. So when you know, we really don't know what's going on. Rather than making decisions for ourselves, we will look around and try and find somebody who appears to know what they're doing and then we'll follow them. Herd behaviour is extremely common among investors. The financial markets are intrinsically risky, but we take comfort from doing what others are doing, particularly people like us. If I'm making a decision that makes me feel uncomfortable, I'm investing in something, it's, it's a risk, I'm uncomfortable taking the risk. One of the things that makes me feel more comfortable is that there are lots of other people running in the same direction. So we get comfort from following the herd. And of course, the more people that follow the herd, the bigger the herd gets, the more it gives us comfort. And so these things can be self-feeding and, and self-exacerbating. The problem when it comes to investing is that it doesn't matter who you are. People like you are probably doing a whole lot of very stupid things. So in investing, unfortunately, because we as humans are such innately poor decision makers, Following other people is really a recipe for success. Um, we have to actually step away from the herd, try to find a way of looking in the other direction, be the contrarian, be the, be the, be the, the person who's willing to swim upstream. Another reason why herding is so prevalent is that it seems intuitively right. It can even feel foolhardy not to follow the crowd. If you were sitting in a movie theater and someone yelled fire, and everyone started leaving the room. You probably wouldn't need to see the fire to get out of that room. That's herd mentality. In some ways, we hate to follow the crowd. In other ways, we know the crowd is smart. 
we know that if most people are responding to something, there's probably something that they're responding to. And so our minds will follow the herd when it seems appropriate. The trouble with herd mentality with investing is that the herd is following the herd. So when irrational exuberance gets started and people just start getting in on some trend and more and more people get excited about that trend, the herd is traveling in one direction. Then as soon as that direction tips and the trend, the bubble breaks, the herd leaves. If we follow the herd, then we're always behind. We're always going to be buying high and selling low. It's particularly in the run up to and the aftermath of market bubbles that herd mentality tends to manifest itself. A classic example was the tech bubble at the end of the 1990s. Herding was also greatly in evidence in 2009 after stock markets had fallen sharply as a result of the financial crisis. You know, if there was ever a time to get into the markets, it was then. And yet, every morning you opened the newspaper, there were scare stories about how it's all going to get worse. It's, and, and this was a, a feeding frenzy, media feeding on itself. And of course, it made everyone else scared. And so no one was acting, no one was getting involved. And there were a few people who bought shares at that point. But most people, even the ones who thought this has got to be a great time to invest, said, I'll just wait a little. And then they did. And they waited a little longer and a little longer. And so uh, it was really, uh, I think, at that time where every rational, dispassionate uh, rule of investing said, now is the time to put your wealth to work, and very few people did. In fact, many fund managers and institutional investors also got it badly wrong in 2009. Analysts' response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill the following year is another example of herding by financial professionals. At the point it went down, the, the analysts who were forecasting BP res BP's results had quite a wide range of, um, of different forecasts. The dispersion was quite high. When the rig went down, in, in the chaos and uncertainty that happened afterwards, um, what happened was all of the forecasts grouped together. So all of the analysts just had no idea what was actually going on. So they started basically looking at each other and trying to figure out what the forecasts were. And the forecast dispersion just went together, just grouped together. And it followed the BP price down. It never got ahead of it. It never predicted what the BP price was going to do. It followed it down. And then it missed the bottom as it bounced up again. Resisting the temptation to join the stampede requires discipline and self-control, but you'll reap the rewards if you manage to do it. Time now to look at availability bias. This is a sort of mental shortcut, which means we give more prominence than we should to the first thing that comes to mind. It's a type of memory bias, if you like, and it's very powerful. There's a wonderful quote in, um, in uh, Danny Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. So Danny Kahneman is the father of behavioral economics. He won the Nobel Prize for it in 2002. In his book, he has this quote, which is, nothing in life is as important as you think it is while you're thinking about it. The mere fact that we've got something in our heads at a moment in time means that we are placing too much weight on that in our decisions. So from an investing point of view, how exactly does availability bias affect our decision making? Availability bias messes up our internal cost-benefit analyses because it bases our, our estimations of probability of certain outcomes on the things we remember. But the things that we remember are not based on good probabilities to begin with. The things that are the most improbable the, the least likely to happen are the things that we remember because they're shocking or because they get news or because um, we talk about them the most. There are different types of availability bias, but one of the most important is called salience. Salience is when something absolutely dramatic happens and it really sticks in the mind. And sometimes these things are multi-generational. So for instance, the Wall Street crash. I mean, every time we have a market downturn, the papers are full about how it's the next Wall Street crash. It never is, but it, it really does live in the memory. Almost the saddest ones I ever heard of was um, in the wake of 
So, you know, all those people died. But another 1,500 people died in the wake of 9-11 because instead of flying, they got in their cars. Another example of availability or memory bias is recency. This is the tendency to give greater weight to recent information than the long-term evidence warrants. So if I were to ask you, what's the likelihood of seeing a red car the next time you go out on the street, your mind may immediately go to the last time you saw cars. And then you would scan that memory to think, of how many of them were read. In an event where you don't have all the information you might need to create a probability in your mind, you will go to maybe the last time you were in that circumstance and use that as your basis of estimation. It's perfectly reasonable to do. The fact is that it just doesn't help us when it comes to investment because what's happened most recently doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to happen in the future. So recency bias has us creating probabilities based on what's recent. So that, in a nutshell, is recency bias. But what can investors do to combat it? The only solution I know to that problem is just to extend your view of recent past. And right now, with Twitter age, right, recent past is often like three minutes. Like, could we just extend our view of the recent past and consider, right, oh, remember just, just five years ago, that happened. I think it causes problems for a lot of people, and it's, it, it's actually not that easy to solve, but that's the solution, is to try to extend your view of the recent past. Remember as well that you shouldn't pay too much attention to the financial media, especially when the markets are in turmoil. I was once asked to do an interview for Bloomberg just after the financial crisis and the interviewers were pressing me and they said, well, this long-term thing is all very well, but do you have any advice for people who are in the market now and are stressed right now and need to do something about it? And to my eternal shame, I said the first thing that popped into my head, which was, um, well, yes, they could turn off Bloomberg for a start. Um, and it, <laughs> I didn't get invited back for a very long time. In short, the way to overcome availability bias is to look at the bigger picture, tune out the noise and focus on the long term. Now for our fifth and final bias. Rational decision making is all about collecting the relevant information and then weighing up the evidence. One of the reasons why we make bad decisions is that we tend to seek out and favour information that reinforces our pre-existing beliefs. This is known as confirmatory or confirmation bias. We all like to think that our beliefs arise out of us looking around, reading the evidence, we gather the evidence and then on the basis of that we formulate our beliefs. The data would suggest actually a lot of the time it's in completely the opposite. Um, we decide what we want to believe and then we go and look for evidence to corroborate it. Take any political issue that you care about and if you see an article with a headline that concludes what you already believe, you're probably a hundred times more likely to share that article with your friends even without reading it. Whereas an article that has a headline that concludes the opposite of what you believe, you will instinctively question and criticize and start to wonder if it's based on good uh, reasoning because it's not confirming what you already believe. Confirmation bias is often associated with those with very strong political or religious convictions, but people can be very single-minded when it comes to investing as well, even if their knowledge is limited. So back in the day when I was roaming bulletin boards, it was, um, it was very, very striking. There was a pattern of behaviour. So people would invest in a, in a share, and if somebody else came along and told them how much they liked it and all the good things about it, they'd get massive support. As soon as somebody popped up and actually said, well, actually, we don't think this is such a good idea, the response was to attack the poster. It wasn't to attack the idea. And we are habitually uh, driven to look for confirmation of our ideas. In fact, we find it very, very difficult when we're presented with something to think of ways of disconfirming it. And the brain just doesn't work that way. You know, if we're presented with a list of things, we only look at the list. We don't try and think of all the other things that could possibly happen. 
Behavioural biases are difficult to overcome and confirmation bias is no exception. But you can make more rational decisions by slowing down, thinking carefully and challenging your gut instinct. If you're investing, you're effectively playing a game of odds against the universe. And to play that game well, you want to be as accurate as possible. You want to be as close to reality as possible, because otherwise the universe is going to win. So what we should constantly be seeking to do is to go, where am I wrong? Where are my beliefs misfounded? And to do that, we need to find ways of playing devil's advocate to ourselves or finding someone else to play devil's advocate for us. What we really need to do in order to make good decisions is catch ourselves when we do this and start to challenge the information that confirms what we believe and open ourselves to the information that challenges what we believe. It's very, very hard to do because our natural inclination is the opposite. So there you have five common biases that investors are prone to. We've barely scratched the surface. There are many more biases that trip investors up. Simply acknowledging these biases, let alone overcoming them, can be very hard. As we've heard just now, investors could do with someone playing devil's advocate every now and again. If you don't yet use a financial advisor, that's a very good reason for hiring one.